with that, Michael, maybe you can just do a quick introduction and then, uh, and then feel free to just flow. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really uh, delighted uh, to be with you all today. Um, I, I think I stalked Nick first a, a year or so ago on LinkedIn. I just thought he would be a fabulous um, uh, member of the faculty at NYU at the School of Professional Studies where I teach. And I uh, was absolutely delighted when he said yes, and, and he's really been a great colleague and a great contributor already. So thank you, Nick, for uh, you know, including me in this talk and uh, introducing me to your colleagues. I am a non-traditional academic. Um, I mean, I have pretty good academic pedigree. I have an undergrad in English from Oxford and a grad degree from Yale and then an MBA from London Business School. But, but I, I don't have a PhD, so I'm not the classic academic. I spent 20 years uh, at Time Warner uh, had left that company when Charter took over the cable company. I, I had been the acting CMO for Time Warner Cable and decided that this was a good time to do something different in my career. But I'd actually started out working in the theater and I was um, you know, a terrible actor at college and then I tried my hand at directing and then I ultimately got into the business side of theater. So I really, uh, you know, I, li I like to think of myself as a, you know, someone who tries to live the whole left brain, right brain thing and um you know uh, and and have brought that discipline or that blend of discipline to the jobs i've done and uh, certainly somebody who loves and adores you know education building capabilities um you know working with uh, emerging young professionals etc so so it's a really uh, a great spot for me now in uh, at nyu um in the school of professional studies and we have about it's a huge program actually it's probably about uh, 1200 students between marketing and PR so we offer a master's in marketing and a master's in PR it's about 1200 students about 250 adjunct faculty uh, so a lot you know a large operation um, and uh, about 25 years old the program uh, so we're celebrating next year our 25th anniversary so that's Great. a bit about me Nick Okay, so so Michael, obviously, what you know, the big question is, what what have you what have you done, you know, immediately? Like, what what was two months ago? How did you adjust the curriculum, and and, and how has that adjustment been and been received by the students and by the and by the faculty as well? Yeah, well, I think that the most immediate thing, sort of, is the most obvious is that we all. So I think probably about uh, seven weeks before the end of the semester. So this week is effectively the end of the semester. Next week would be graduation. So about seven weeks before the end of the semester, we moved all of our teaching from uh, what is almost 100% in-person, -pers you know, classroom-based, lab-based, to remote learning, uh, which means essentially what we technically call remote sync because it means that the faculty member is still conducting his or her class with uh, the group of students but it's all done via zoom um, and all done remotely um, you know that obviously causes some uh, challenges uh, you've got folks who were less comfortable you know using the technology we have very good technology to start with not not just zoom but a, a whole sort of what's called a, an lms learning management system that was uh, built for NYU and, and, and it, so there's a lot of where the content is kept and where to find things and how to navigate. That was all effectively online already, but clearly many faculty are most comfortable on their feet in front of students interacting directly personally. And many faculty were less comfortable you know, navigating Zoom and using Zoom, which we've all found you know, can be both powerful and frustrating. So, so there was a, a massive sort of student body right um, over uh, a few days, actually. And then thankfully, we, the following week after we pivoted, uh, there was uh, spring break. So it gave us a chance to think internally about how we were going to do this and how to get people trained. And we have excellent resources at NYU at the School of Professional Studies where um, they have a center for academic excellence and support, including a whole technology group um, who then started putting on these amazing webinars and training programs and you know sort of hunting down lots of different issues and and then our faculty came together in a couple of really interesting ways i think are worth worth sharing one is uh the marketing faculty produced a uh, basically a google doc but it was a whole host of best practice resources 
you know, training programs you could jump on, uh, articles people had read and found, um, just sort of sharing experiences, uh, teaching via Zoom, et cetera, which was, I think, quite helpful and became a model for the rest of the school to some extent, uh, to, and that material was leveraged by others. And then the second thing is we came together because obviously many of our students uh, were displaced at all sorts of different levels, uh, including many of our international students who chose to go back home. And, you know, there was some strong feeling among the faculty that we wanted to reach out to them. And we made a, uh, a nice video, uh, you know, sort of a together apart video, which probably would not have met uh, Roken's production standards, but, you know, it was, it was a decent effort and I think was very well appreciated by the students because um, they're clearly feeling, um, you know, they're probably feeling uh, more of the isolation and the distancing than the faculty do perhaps. Um, so that, you know, those are the two most immediate things and, and, and all over the last, you know, five, seven weeks, we've been gradually sort of adding to our knowledge and capacity to teach online uh with new tools or or new training programs um it wasn't an entirely foreign thing to us by the way we already offered a number of courses remotely and a number of courses uh what they call async you know so no no immediate instructor in front of a group of students but all mitigated online but for the marketing and pr programs the vast majority of them had historically been in-person classes it was probably a bigger a bigger lift for us and so out of out of curiosity how is how has the shift in teaching been and the reason why i ask is is obviously virtual vir the medium of virtual teaching requires adjustments and shifts beyond just putting up a powerpoint and and, me and meandering through it how how have teachers um adjusted how they teach to that specific medium yeah, well, I, I think one of the things that's very interesting, and I would imagine it's been true for your craft as well, in, you know, in, in Rokan, and, and, and uh, I know everybody on the call comes from different disciplines, but uh, there's been a lot of going back to basics and, and going back to, okay, what, what are, in our case, what's the basics of good pedagogy? What, what does it mean to be an effective teacher? How do you uh, pass out the course content into you know manageable modules and and uh, and how do you engage students and get them to interact um there's there's a model we use or at least a way of thinking through the engagement it's often called learner to learner learner to content and learner to instructor yes yeah? so or learner to teacher so you want as much as you can in any active learning environment to have students interacting with each other interacting with the content uh, you know whether it's an article a case a reading a video whatever and then interacting with each other. Um, uh, so, you know, so instructor with the instructor, with the content and with each other. And all of those things can be done actually quite well online. Um, and you just have to sort of rethink your approach to how you're doing those things. And in fact, what we found is in many cases, many instructors have found uh, the online nature and, um, you know, making sure that their lecture notes and PowerPoints or their resources were easily accessible uh, via this LMS I was talking about, but you know, on the online and what's called NYU classes, by making those things accessible to people and sort of thinking it through a bit more, um, it's improved everybody's game. Yeah, because first of all, you have to be a bit more planful than you might be if you were in a classroom thinking on your feet. Although, arguably, you should be planning there anyway. But you also are, are curating some of the digital content, um, which tends to be more visual and more auditory than just lecture notes, you know, so you're curating the content in, in a way that's very helpful for students. Again, especially if the students, uh, you know, some of our students are English as a second language or, you know, uh, just want a, a bit of time to reflect on the material. So there's a lot of elements of teaching online which actually have led to a much higher level of engagement. Um, I think individuals are still exploring, you know, uh, their style and how that style translates. And, and for many, I think, you know, it's still a, an adjustment or, or, or a transition to, um, you know, understand how they can uh, really, you know, interact. I think that's probably the word we hear more often. How do you interact with students when they're all sort of boxes on a, on a, on a screen?
And Michael, what are what are the students saying? I, I'm I'm aware that you probably only have whatever 60, 90 days of data points, but what has been like what are students' responses right now to you know the teaching experience? The other thing I want to ask you subsequent to that is I, I know that a lot of NYU students are from China and I assume a lot of them are based in China. So how are you dealing with let's say the time zone? I know that it's it's yeah. AM PM. So, you know, how how is all that working? You know, we we are fielding a survey right now of students to get a better, you know, sense of the, the the actual data about students' experience with remote learning. So we'll have probably some better information in a couple of weeks. But the anecdotal so what I'm gonna share is more anecdotal. You know, anecdotally um, the, the response has been quite positive. I think, uh, you know, at the base level that students have appreciated that the school has, you know, really gone out of its way to keep business as usual and help them in their academic progression. I mean, that was one of the most important things, uh, you know, we, we, we as a team, and, I, and this, these were messages coming from the president of the university early on, you know, we want to ensure that all students are successful, that they're able to achieve, you know, their academic goals, personal professional goals, what have you. And so uh, there's been a really, a very heavy commitment to like, let's just get it done. Let's, you know, let's uh, keep, keep going. Um, let's let's uh, provide the students with the, the support they need. Um, and I, I honestly haven't heard any negative feedback about the experience um, from students. I, I, again, this is all anecdotal. You know, generally I think people are, have, bigger things on their mind, let's put it that way. You know, I think we all of us are, have other things to worry about. In many cases, students, as you indicated, have to figure out how to get home and, you know, how to, you know, shelter in place safely and where they were going to do that, et cetera. So, you know, my sense is that study and the routine of studying has actually been something of a comfort to a lot of people, you know, in, in what is an otherwise uncertain time. And I imagine for any of you who have, you know, kids at home, at high school or middle school, whatever, you know, you probably, it's probably true for them as well. It's a little bit of a routine, which provides some, uh, you know, some solace. Um, but uh, the question about students, you know, and time zones, I do think that's something we're going to have to look at for the summer, um, you know, uh, which, where we will continue to teach remotely, um, uh, see how we can better accommodate students it's obviously a challenge um, anybody who's been in academic administration you know one of the biggest challenges is simply the scheduling of, of classes um, in the fall um, to give you an example in the fall of any given semester in my in our marketing program i'll schedule about 180 sections of, of class so and they can only happen you know essentially between monday and friday or sometimes they happen on saturday so trying to accommodate all those students across 180 sections, um, you know, without overlapping um, or at least allowing students to take all the courses they need is, is, is a bit logistically challenging. Uh, if you then add on top, you know, sort of time zones and things like that, but we're, we're going to work through those things. Um, I think, as I said, when we first moved, we had to do a student body, right? We didn't sort of start moving timing around too much. In fact, we were asked, you know, to kind of keep the schedules as they were. But we're exploring some of those options. And you know, generally, if you have 100% of the students in a group agreeing to something different, you can figure out some other ways to accommodate you know, uh, time zone changes. And our faculty, to be, you know, just to be clear, have been amazing about that level of flexibility. Very, very, very committed group of people, I found. So. Michael, can you tell me, I mean, you've spoken to me about the classroom experience now obviously a lot of learning takes a lot of the nyu experience takes place in the corridors of nyu right and, and through the events so what are you doing i know obviously you know you've just had probably 60 days to, to to change your entire you know experience around learning so have you done anything to um to compensate for that no longer being there yes yeah, so you know i um, it's probably an area where I think uh, it's like many, you know, I mean, I will probably get onto a broader conversation about what impacts, you know, and I'm actually very interested in hearing from this distinguished group, your thoughts about what impact you think uh, COVID-19 has had on long-term consumer behavior and business and the brands you guys are working with. I, I'd be very interested in that as a discussion, perhaps towards the end. But 
But, you know, my sense is uh, the one thing I think most people agree on is this accelerated things that were sort of started or happening anyway. And, and or things that we've been talking about doing and people said, oh, that'd be a bit difficult, you know, but with, the, with, 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 with what's happened and, and the fact that we've been compelled to move online, we suddenly were able to be very creative. So what do I mean by that? What a specific example would be, you know, we organize in the department and the student clubs, for example, a large number of uh, um, speaker meetings, book talks, you know, coffee hours, things like that. We just moved them all online. It was as simple as that. You know, I don't think there was one that we canceled at all, certainly not in my department, that we canceled. Um, and that meant, you know, the PR League, for example, which is a group of students, um, uh, had a full, you know, five panel, multi room, uh, you know, focus on your career type session. And it moved entirely online and they used the breakout rooms of Zoom and setting up all sorts of different um, Zoom links. And they had this amazing, amazing conference about you know, your careers and, and, and had a phenomenal number of students join it. We've had uh, you know, Rashad Tabakawala come speak uh, to students. He was, you know, he was scheduled to come anyway and uh, talk about his, his, his new book. And we, he was very gracious to just move that online. It was fantastic. We had uh, Javier Meza, the global CMO of Coke, uh, who spoke with us recently, Karen uh, Field Nelson, who's a you know, very well-known academic out of uh, Australia, just got a new book about the attention economy. Um, you know, we just, we had um, uh, Javi, uh, sorry, uh, Fadi Karam, you know, who used to run Nestle North America, you know, it's just amazing people who have just jumped on uh, Zoom and, 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 and done what they would have done. I believe actually it's been a more interactive and engaging experience potentially uh it, you could argue that it didn't give students perhaps time to kind of mill around later and ask questions in person and all that all of which is very important but you know the chat function the q a function a well curated moderated conversation even with 150 or 200 people on a webinar you know can be a productive uh engagement and then many students very smartly have followed up with uh, the speakers on LinkedIn and, uh, you know, and, and there seems to be a, 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 my observation is people seem to be very relaxed, you know, as much more, people seem to be a lot more relaxed about these kind of engagements. There's a lot less infrastructure and formality when we do it on the, on the Zoom versus, you know, getting everyone into a room and it's a certain time and, you know, it, it has been a really interesting dynamic. So I think we haven't missed the beat. Uh, I would like to think that I, I the, it's a good question, Nick, about co-curricular stuff, because that I get lots of really positive comments from students coming back to me about those events and, you know, and continuing that. And then today, actually, we just I don't know if you guys saw you know, the PR Council uh, has developed this because uh, we have because we have a marketing program and a PR program. So we watch the PR space as well. They've developed this program that will go all through the summer which is essentially uh, given that no agencies are hiring and there are no internships, et cetera, they've curated all this asynchronous content from all the big agencies. So we're now, we're part of that initiative. So our students, even if they don't have internships or some will be able to continue sort of working with agencies and agency leaders and things like that. So, you know, there's lots of innovation. Um, and I, you know, I'd like to believe that we've been trying to fill the gaps as much as possible. Okay. So Michael, I want to shift gears, ask you one last question, uh, and then I'm going to open it up for, uh, for questions from the group. Um, but before I ask you the question, I want to play you a video from Gary Vaynerchuk, and that's the video basically that I was referring to earlier. Hold on, just give me a quick moment. Can you see my screen? Yep. It's outdated globally. It's outdated. The internet made it outdated because information is a commodity and the school system was built on me memorization of information. Why do I have to do any math? I have a calculator on my iPhone that can give you any math. Yeah. I don't need to know anything. I can ask Siri and Alexa in two seconds, they'll give me the answer. You know, who cares about the periodic table when I can tell you what, like it just, it's so uncomfortably outdated globally because it's predicated on memorization of information in a world where we have information at our fingertip within a second for zero cost, the whole thing's dead. How do we fix it? 
uh, it's the parent's responsibility. So, I mean, obviously he, he goes off on, and, and, uh, on his rants about how <clears throat> useless education is. So I just wanted to get your, your point of view on, on that. You know, it, it, well, it's been so fascinating for me to move from, uh, you know, the world of business into the world of education. And I think probably all of your colleagues would have a, uh, a similar, will probably have had a similar experience when they move from one domain to another, is all the things, all the assumptions you made about something, or, you know, all your uh, biases and inherent beliefs often prove not to be true, yes? So... The model that Gary's talking about is a very old and already outdated model of education. You know, I mean, you take NYU as an example. Uh, NYU has been reimagining learning for the longest time. Uh, you know, this is a school where almost 100 years ago, uh, it was the very first university in America to offer a course in public relations. The famous Edward Bernays, the father of PR. Uh, gave his first set of lectures in PR at NYU almost 100 years ago. You know, before uh, before there was a before there was a publicist. You know, um, and 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 you've got incredible schools like Gallatin. Uh, you know, who've done these individualized majors and you know very eclectic, uh, you know, non-domain specific, interactive uh, kind of programs. And and I think that you know certainly at the school of professional studies uh, I, I i know it predates me for certain but it's very much a kind of watchword for how we approach things we're, we're much more interested in you know again this idea of the whole brain so it's certainly not just memorization and it's certainly not just analytic it's the joining of creative uh, and and analytic thinking we're interested in experiential things real world experiential um, things so so you have to actively learn it's absolutely not about memorization I mean I, I I can hear myself saying you know why are we even giving exams at grad school you know is that really is that's not really what we need to do and and finally it's it's all about you know professional applied education so so I think the model that you know he and others are, are, are responding to is is probably already an outdated model and is a mischaracterization of most really good education today. So, you know, I don't feel too worried about the specifics of those claims. Should, should the modern university, uh, you know, schools like ours be responsive to shifts in consumer demand and, 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 and technology, et cetera? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and I think that they are uh, in many places, sometimes the leaders in incorporating some of the new, um, you know, modalities and technology, as we were talking about before, into learning. But, but I don't think, uh, you know, uh, well, clearly, I wouldn't make the argument uh, that, that Gary's making that they're outdated or outmoded. They, they need to constantly revisit, revise, um, change practices, like we all do, like any, like any enterprise, you know, needs to, to, to revisit those things. So, Michael, based on that, let's just hit my last question, which is, so, I mean, the criticism that marketing uh, programs get is that your, your, your idea of updating the program is updating Philip Kotler's book into edition 35, you know? So, how, what, what are you, how, are, how is NYU keeping up with the changes? Some are valid and some maybe aren't valid in terms of, some are just noise. How are you keeping up with the changes um, yeah. in marketing? Well, I think, I think you, you know, it starts from a belief that we have in our faculty, in our community, is that marketing, and, and to a large extent PR, but marketing is a human-centered and data-driven enterprise, yes? And I want all students who graduate from our program to have a deep sense and appreciation for both of those domains. And so we spend as much time you know, really trying to situate what we learn in, in, in the practice of consumer behavior and consumer insights, as we do in the analysis of data and the leveraging of technology, et cetera. And, and those things often are not contained within textbooks because they have happened in the last year or two or, or what have you. And, you know, one of the enormous virtues of the School of Professional Studies is that, it, at least in my program, in our programs, Nick, it's, it's largely an adjunct faculty base, which means that the vast majority of these teachers are working professionals like yourself, Nick, 
who are in the thick of what clients need and want and require. So, so, so uh, you know, we're, we're sort of inherently always updating the program. Now, I would pause and say, I'm a great believer, though, that there are some fundamentals to marketing. There are some basic principles, which it doesn't hurt us to revisit. And often those basic principles are quite well captured in some of the better texts. And they don't have to be academic texts. You know, there are plenty of sort of somewhat more popular books, but have become like, you know, Trout's work on positioning and things like that, that have become, you know, almost standard Bibles, but it could be Benet and Field's work, uh, you know, all the great work that comes out of the U on, U U UK on planning. Um, you know, there's a ton of really wonderful work being written by practitioners that can be incorporated into our uh, study. And, and one of the things we're really trying to teach people is to be critical consumers of all this information. Yeah, because I think one of the uh, challenges we've had as marketers, and, you know, I think one of the reasons why you see CMO positions, you know, originally we were all talking about tenure being reduced, and then we're talking about, oh, we're all, you know, we're becoming chief growth, the chief growth officers are replacing us, and what do we do? And, you know, now the chief communications officer maybe has a pole position because of this idea about thought leadership. So all of this, all of this sort of convergence and, and shifts that are going on, um, you know, the most important thing is to remain intellectually curious and, and to be, and have a sort of diverse um, a way of, of engaging with the content and, and the thinking and, and people um, who are practicing marketing today. So, you know, I, 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 I don't spend a lot of time worrying about or, or let's say I don't spend a lot of time anchoring our thinking around a textbook. I, I do think for many students, textbooks have value. And I think many textbooks still contain some real wisdom, but, but we, we, don't, we don't teach, you know, teach to a textbook, certainly. We, we're looking at that curriculum all the time. And, and as I said, the enormous value is that, you know, faculty will wander in and they say, hey, uh, you know, the, the moldy cheeseburger, what do you think, you know, and then, and then, and then we go at it and we talk about the moldy cheeseburger, you know, or, or whatever campaign it might be, or whatever, uh, you know, latest development on the analytics side, it might be, or we'll talk about ethical issues, you know, and those are things which, you know, you, we build time and, and room in, in the curriculum and in the class to have those conversations. So, we, so the, you know, the content in textbooks and, and a whole host of other readings, videos, uh, TED Talks, whatever it is, that they they provide a base, um, but then there's a whole host of other ways by which students can really engage and learn. And I'm I'm hoping that they're doing that, uh, you know, through the auspices and the guidance of of faculty in a way that's much more contemporary and uh, you know re relevant. Michael, I know we're at time, and we've we've obviously taken up a little bit more of your time, which which we're uh, super thankful of and appreciative. I think on behalf of Broken and Publicis, we're, we're super grateful. I know I, I sleep smarter tonight because of this conversation mm -hmm. and, and, and we're, we're, in your, we're in your debt for, for your time and your thoughts and your wisdom. And I love the fact that even in such a shitty time, you're, you're seeing, you know, it's, it's, you're a breath of optimism and, and, and how, you know, agile NYU has been and, and, and your, your approach to it, I think, sends a, sends a wonderful example to to all of us, at least to myself. So, so thank you so, so much, Michael, for being with us. Well, it's my deep pleasure, really, guys. You, you're, doing, uh, you're doing incredible work and we, we need to keep communicating. So thank you very much, guys. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Bye, guys. Cheers, Bye, guys. Michael. Bye. Thank Bye. you.